Hello, I'm Danny with B9 Creations, and we're a global provider of additive manufacturing solutions. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Adrian at Actuonics, Eric from B9 Creations, and you'll also hear from Kevin at Johnson & Johnson and Martin from R5 Training on micro-scale prototyping to short-run production, understanding how to leverage additive manufacturing across the value stream. As a global provider of this technology, we've become the industry leader in production speed and value, focusing on high precision applications from medical to aerospace, prototyping and manufacturing, model making, research, jewelry, and beyond. You can see some of the customers we serve below, from 3M and Johnson and Johnson to Medtronic, Pella, and Procter and Gamble. Here you can see our global expanse, serving customers, certified dealers, and strategic partners in nearly 70 countries across the globe. Now I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Eric, could you tell us a little bit about your background, your role? Yeah, um, I'm Eric Henriksen. I'm the product manager at B9 Creations. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I was actually hired onto B9 Creations as a design engineer, and I became the lead design engineer for the um, Core Series uh, printer platform, which is now uh, basically the, the printer that all of our current uh, sale items are based off of. Um, so I have a I have a background in some off highway vehicle mechanics and uh, and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Uh, but I've been with B9 Creations for four years now and kind of transitioned from that design engineering role into more product management where I help our customers, um, I guess, internal and external customers. I help uh, interpret between, uh, you know, just raw customer feedback into uh, real actionable items that B9 can take and turn into products or take existing products and make them better. Excellent. We're excited to, to get into it with that background. And then Adrian, I'd love to give you the same opportunity. Could you tell folks a little bit about what you do and your background as well as Actuonics? Yeah. So my name is Adrian Prince. Uh, I've worked for Actuonics for about three years now as the um, mechanical engineer here. Um, I started off just doing research and development and slowly moved into doing custom design work for customers as well as now I work on revising and improving our current actuator line. Um, at Actuonics, we design, sell, and manufacture micro linear actuators. Um, so you can find those on our website. Um, and we focus on small units and my research and development is based on smaller and smaller, more powerful actuators. That's great. You know, this whole trend of miniaturization and micro scale printing is across a lot of industries from medical to manufacturing and beyond. And so a lot of times folks understand how to use that in a prototyping R&D capacity. And we'll hear from customers leveraging it that way. But I'm very excited for you to help people understand how do you move beyond that and start to leverage it in a, in a final in-use production environment, as well as just ongoing as you go throughout a product's life cycle. So thank you for that introduction. So I'd love to start off here in the R&D space. I'm gonna have you hear from Kevin, who is a senior engineer at Johnson & Johnson in their cardiovascular division. He's going to share a bit more about this macro trend of miniaturization in the medical device industry, as well as the specific types of applications he's leveraging micro scale 3D printing for. Um, but, you know, there's a ton of printers out there in the market. And one of the things that, you know, our group does before purchasing a new printer is really trying to test capabilities. So um, I met you know, the B9 sales team at a large trade show and I reached out to them to try to get a test print out. And that's the part that you're looking at on the screen. Um, as you can see by the envelope size, it's really small. It's four millimeters by two millimeters by two millimeters. And like Scott said, you know, everything's going to miniaturization and, and getting smaller. Um, so this part is actually representative of the size and features of a complex component that we use in our catheters. You know, honestly, when I reached out to them, I didn't think features would be resolved. And we've tried this in a bunch of other printers, uh, but they turned around and sent this to me within uh, the next day. Um, so if you're looking at the part at the top, there's two 8,000 struts. Um, it came out perfectly vertical. Uh, there's th three holes horizontally along the body. Those are 3,000 diameter by 6,000 deep, and those things resolve perfectly. And then the little... Um, three vertical holes on the bottom left that's actually sitting on a fin that tapers all the way down to one thou. 
So it's really amazing to us that the technology now has really evolved so we can get these kind of parts within a few hours. So I'm sure you can relate, Adrian, to kind of this notion of I have to do the impossible that maybe traditional manufacturing can't deliver in terms of these micro scale parts. And oh, by the way, I need them in an hour. Could you share a little bit from your experience just on the R&D sense, how you're using additive manufacturing? Yeah, so before we purchased our B9 creations, I should give you a little background. We used to use leverage th third party printing companies like Proto Labs and things like that. So their turnaround was typically one to two weeks, which is okay for, you know, slow iteration process. Um, but we really wanted to step that up and because we we're putting out parts about every four months, um, which means an actuator about one one to two years, we'd probably redevelop a new one. So we wanted to really shorten that design time and where that came into play was a 3d printer in-house so now what i was able to do is i can make multiple iterations of parts that would normally have taken six weeks but now i'm i've cut that down significantly to about two to three days where what i can do now is i'll 3d print the part and luckily or nicely it's gray which i can now put on my 3d scanner that we also purchased about at the same time and with the 3D scanner, I'll scan the part and be able to make a digital thread and create an inspection report based on that part. So what I'm doing is 3D printing a part, scanning it, creating an inspection report, and now I know exactly what that part's like. I can put it into my designs, and if I need to make changes, I can make changes that day, print again, and again, inspect that part so I know exactly what I'm working with what tolerances I need and what's going to work on our future parts for production. Yeah, that's excellent. When you think about a product life cycle where you need it every one to two years, it becomes hypercritical that those prototyping design iterations start to speed up and you're not yeah. slowed down on meeting your own customers needs because your right. technology isn't keeping pace. You know, I, we get a question a lot about how do you validate dimensions and tolerance with these micro scale parts. You mentioned using scanning to validate that. Do you do any other type of fitment tests or things that let you know you're hitting the tolerances you need to? Uh, so uh, before I got the 3D scanner, we would use precision pins, calipers, Vernier calipers. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily be able to make custom fixtures to do those fitment tests, um, which now using or having a 3D printer in house, I can actually make our own no-go go gauges for testing our production parts as well as using those to test our R&D parts. That's great. You know, I think that's something people maybe don't think about using 3D printing for, but it makes complete sense. And it, it's kind of a nice segue into my next question. So we also hear from folks fairly often, how do I think about everything from design for manufacturing when I'm doing things additively with an eye towards the future to this whole concept of bringing things through functional testing so that by the time you get to manufacturing, you don't have hopefully any huge surprises. Could you talk a little bit about how you think through the design, leveraging those different technologies? Yeah. So, I mean, 3D printing, you can almost print any shape, but how are you going to make that in production? So you always, from the get-go, um, I'm always thinking, how is this part going to be manufactured in production? So you want to keep that into, into consideration throughout the very beginning of the design process. Having a 3D printer in-house, it allows me to design a part with just the critical features that I need. And then I can print that part without any molding draft modifications required. So I can first quickly test the critical features and know that that part will work. And then now with having it in house, I can do multiple iterations of different mold changes that I need to make. Um, and on that note, in the tooling process of the mold, say the mold maker needs or is required to make a certain change to the mold, I can then go print a part with that change first to determine if it's going to be successful in the mold modification. Yeah, that's excellent. And you mentioned you had gotten a scanner around the same time that you adopted 3D printing. 
Can you talk about what it took to implement this digital thread in your factory? Or maybe you had this and it just looks slightly different with the addition of additive? Yeah, so originally um, we just basically have our paper drawings and we'd have an inspection report, which we would inspect to whether we input that on a piece of paper or in an Excel document, um, where now I can use this 3D scanner and it basically creates a 3D model with all my measurements in software. And then I can go and just hit print and it'll print the report for myself. But that being said, I can then go and have this STL that's been created from the scanner. And if I wanted, I could either reprint it, make modifications to it, which would be making modifications to the printed part, not my design part, which could be very beneficial if you needed slight changes to a certain feature, but didn't know exactly what those values needed to be. I love that. And you know, it probably helps too, since you are the R&D engineer, but you're also doing quality assurance and needing to be able to talk with people out in manufacturing to just have this traceability too. You, you work in a lot of industries that require that level of traceability and, and um, yeah. clear chain of custody. Could you talk a little bit about For that? For sure. So specifically with our medical device customers, we see a lot of them have extremely tight tolerances that they're requesting or complex parts, but they also, on top of this, they need to make sure that it we adhere to a certain quality control procedure or ISO. Um, but so they want to be able to know that their parts conform to the, the specifications. Well, with the 3D scanner, it basically almost removes any user error using standard measuring techniques. Um, and it really brings down the precision or error in those measurements to a usable metric for those medical device companies. And again, back to the traceability, we now have full 3D scan files as well as inspection software files that we can pass on to them so that they can, it's proven that the part conforms. I think that's huge. That can be kind of a stumbling block as you move from R&D into different parts of your value stream and thinking through everything from lean manufacturing to what's the regulatory environment I need to operate in. So that's some wonderful tactical advice I think people can take as they're trying to figure out how to scale as well. I'd like to switch gears just a little bit here. You know, you talked a lot about how you're leveraging additive on the design and production side of the house but it's also enabling business growth. Can you share more about how you're using additive to open up new revenue streams? Yeah, definitely. Um, so originally this, we picked up the 3D printer um, mainly for my research and development iteration process to reduce, but where we've really seen another value add to the 3D printer um, was that it's now allowing us where, so Typically with our current suppliers, we have minimum order quantities of about 500 to 1,000, which that's quite a few parts, especially, you know, our actuators are $100. Some of those smaller companies who are just starting out designing um, their new device and they're using one or two of these in their device, but they need a few to prototype. Um, but they need a slight modification that our stock units may not work for them. So this is where AM comes in, additive manufacturing. It's just opened up so many more doors to us. So where now customers, I can say, yeah, we can lower MOQ down to from one if that's their requirement. I mean, some added costs there, but we can do that or fit down to 50, we can do that as well. So we're seeing a lot of customers now who we'd have to say no to um, where they're forced to either go somewhere else um, or kind of use our stock unit, but doesn't necessarily work in their design. So they can't really design for their production because they can't receive those working parts yet. So now Adam Manufacturing has allowed me to make those custom parts in house within a couple days, as well as I'm now able to inspect those parts, ensure that they're to spec and then we can build those into actuators and send those out within the week. Where before we're looking at minimum order quantity of 500 and we're looking at about four months before I could get 
those custom parts or custom actuators to the customer. Wow, that's incredible. Not only how you've been able to speed up your own cycle time, but what you're doing for their products yeah. and being able to innovate for their customer needs as well. So I love that it's opening up new revenue streams. Have you seen any opportunities with existing customers where maybe you get them a little bit earlier in the product process before they're ready to go into injection molding or customer loyalty and stickiness, all of these things yeah. that help a business be successful. Can you share it, more about that? For sure. So we've got a few customers that approach us and they need, um, well, they, they're familiar with our actuators already. They've been designing with them, um, but they need a slight, slight change and they only want 30 of them, but they're anticipating that they've got 500 on coming on the go in next year. Um, so we can offer those volumes now with added manufacturing and cut down the times where we can su supply to them. I think that's wonderful. And then, you know, I think my, my last question on this topic is obviously Actuanix has a value proposition. You develop incredibly high precision actuators, but you do it in a way that makes it accessible to and affordable to businesses. How do you feel like you've been able to translate that same core differentiator that you have established in injection molding, but now what type of value-based services are you starting to offer on the 3D printing side? Yeah, so the, the main thing now is that we can almost offer a custom actuator solution um, at low volumes without the long lead time. But then at the same time, we can then does it, at the current stage, we'll be designing with them for manufacturing, but we could say produce these parts for them for X amount. But as soon as we get to a higher volume or they finally hit that volume, then we can actually push into moving those parts into injection molding. Um, and then we can further reduce their costs on those actuators. So it's kind of a, a give and take where we're able to um, reduce time cost as well as MOQs. It's really a full turnkey solution. I mean, whatever part you weren't capturing before you're able to now. That's exactly. Pretty incredible. And it's yeah. a very hard thing to do as a business, offer a turnkey solution. So it is. that's neat to hear. Yeah. So you had some really fun specific examples of what this looked like in dollars and cents and time between outsourcing and then bringing tech in-house. Could you give this concrete example to some of our attendees here so they can understand what does it look like in real terms if I yeah, were to make this shift too? Absolutely. So let's just say we'll focus on one part. We've got one part that we've got on our design. We have a step file created. Okay, it looks good. Well, now we need to test it in the real world. See first if we can make it. Um, I'd start with 3D printing. So if 3D printing is successful, um, that's great. But most people, they don't have a 3D printer. So what do you do? Well, you send it off to a third party. That's going to take, if you want to make it as fast expedited, it's going to be about a week. If it's standard, about two weeks. So one part, you get it in two weeks. Okay, now what? How much did that car part cost? Well, say you got five of them. They're about $80 a part now. Okay, so you're two weeks down the road and you've spent about $400 and you've got five parts in hand, but you need a slight modification. Okay, you send off that new modified part for printing. There's another two weeks down the road, another $400 and your time. And I think to me, my time is worth a lot more than a few hundred dollars here and there. So we've really saw a huge increase in our time savings by having a 3D printer in house. So what I was able to do is now with the B9 creations, which we've done a lot of research and came to the conclusion that the B9 Core XL was the best printer for us. It had the build platform that we wanted to be able to do production runs as well as the precision needed for our small intricate parts, as well as its print time was significantly faster than many of the other competitors. So that put us into a one day iteration process where now I can get about three iterations per part within eight hours. That includes the printing, cleaning, curing, and scanning and inspection process. 
that we have in-house currently. So we went from a two week iteration process down to a one day where I'm getting three different parts, not just one in the two weeks, as well as now my part cost is less than a dollar um, on most of them. Cause I mean, my parts specifically are very small, less than an inch by an inch typically. Um, so our part price is very low, but when you send it off to a third party, it doesn't matter volume. It's more about individual print prices. Um, so I found that doing any volume of prints there, they're extremely expensive where it's 40 to $80 a part, depending on your volume of that part. That's wonderful. I think it really helps people to see in dollar and cents what the trade off looks like. And I love your point about don't just look at how much you're spending, look at how much time you're spending, because that yeah. all has a monetary value too. And it's easy to put that in a different part of your budget, but it's so critical when you're trying to move fast. Yeah. And one thing I would like to add is Please. in your typical manufacturing design process, um, your th 3D printing will save you so much time in the by having a printer in house, so that you can spend more time on the production manufacturing tooling. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, mold making takes a certain amount of time, and you cannot speed it up without more money. But sometimes that money becomes exponentially too great, so you're still stuck with about 30 days to 40 day lead time for a tool, where you want to get to that iteration process as fast as possible because that's your longest lead time. So you wanna get that started. Having the 3D printing in house allows you to get to that point within say a week, as opposed to having to wait four months to get that part to where it needs to be. And then now you're pushing it into a mold, but you gotta wait again for four months to get that part to where you need it to be. So it really cuts down that earlier design stage and iteration process significantly to really allow you to jump into the longer lead time manufacturing methods. Yeah, that's huge. Eric's intimately familiar with that as well. When you're designing these products, you get to a point where it's just an immovable rock. It's gonna take this amount of time or longer. So being able to understand where can I intelligently and effectively shorten parts of my process because I know there's big swaths of it, but it just is what it is. So I'm really, I'm really glad you brought up that point. Yeah. That's a good segue to Eric. You know, we help folks with this a lot as well. Uh, doing what Adrian helped his own company do, which is think about what are my production inputs? How does that translate into real business case outputs? And then how do I come up with some type of total cost of ownership, whether it's two printers together or a printer and injection molding or a printer and outsourcing so that I can understand what it means to bring it in versus continuing with the status quo. Could you maybe talk a little bit about things folks don't think about when they're doing this, whether it's throughput or hidden costs, like post-processing, training and maintenance, things like that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so Adrian, you touched on a lot of the really important bullet points here. There, Like Danny said, there are a couple more uh, hidden or less obvious things that um, you know we could delve into a little bit. Um, a big one that you just mentioned, Danny, is training, actually. So with more traditional manufacturing techniques, um, getting an operator up to speed on those things. I mean, sometimes in some cases, it's even like kind of a, a apprentice and journeyman type of relationship. You know, you have to you have to take years in, until you're proficient on these types of uh, manufacturing equipment, even if all you're doing is producing uh, prototypes, you're not even producing and use parts. But in order to get that type of uh, pre uh, precision output, I guess, repeatability uh, from your parts, that's the, t that's the kind of training and know-how you need. Uh, whereas if you transition over into additive manufacturing, specifically if we talk about the B9 uh, core series printers, um, you know, we've, we've seen training times go from, in some cases, years, you know, in most cases, months, depending on how, how people are making parts. But down to like days. I mean, you can get proficient operators on this type of stuff in in a week. Um, it does not take uh, a, a degree in this type of stuff to run this equipment, um, specifically the core series. 
is um, you know a one touch screen with one button and a USB uh, slot. So there is there is not a lot of complexity to this. Um, additionally, we've built in some kind of cool features like um, uh, print queue, uh, where you can actually have uh, the operator who's running the machine and the person who's doing job planning be two separate people. Um, and the operator then, it, their only job is to take the prints off the printer when they're done and put a new build table back in and hit go. Um, so there's, there's things like that that we've done that have kind of really, I guess, made that learning curve less steep, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, also, more things to keep in mind um, on top of what Adrian said in terms of, you know, speeding up your design process and things like that. There's also um, things to consider like throughput. Um, this is more the case if you're if you're actually using your additively manufactured part as like an end use component. Um, but this is where we would help you kind of consider, um, OK, I can fit this many parts on a build table. Um, and if I run that at X hours per day, uh, how, what am I actually getting off that printer? And then would it actually make sense to run multiple printers for that? Um, and maybe, and maybe it's, uh, not a single not part, a single maybe part. it's an assembly, <laughs> right? So you actually need, uh, different quantities of each, um, and working through that, um, in terms of what parts do I need when? is actually a fairly um, important part of this. Um, another thing I would potentially mention here in case anybody's considering taking the dive into additive, specifically again to core series printers um, is a maintenance. Um, you know, that, that's something that people are quite used to with more traditional manufacturing techniques. Um, with the core series printers, uh, it is very minimal in terms of maintenance. We have an air filter you need to change out every once in a while. And then uh, the vat, which is the part of the printer that holds the liquid uh, resin, just needs to be cleaned, um, you know, periodically. So there are, there are no um, times when you need to essentially shut down a line in order to do giant maintenance procedures. Um, it's just that small daily maintenance stuff that uh, keeps the printer going and going. Um, so yeah, I think that, that covers a lot of what you said. Was there anything I didn't cover that you asked about there, Danny? No, I, I think that's perfect. And I'm really glad you brought up downtime too, because that's another thing where you maybe don't think about it till it happens. And then that costs both time and money. So right. I appreciate you bringing that point up. And I'll just add here, if anyone wants a personalized cost comparison, we do this a lot. So feel free to email info at b9c.com and we will give you a tailored calculator, if you will, going through all the things Eric and Adrian mentioned to see what makes sense for you. So with that, this is Martin. He's with R5 Training and he's a little earlier than Adrian is in terms of his product and his experience with 3D printing. And so I thought it would be very helpful to hear what it looks like to leverage us as a service bureau to develop rapid part iterations for a consumer tech product. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about your company and kind of your role in it. Yeah, so um, it all started with kind of this whole idea of R5 training, which is, it's, it's just basically, a, it started off with a, an app to help people um, just kind of reach their fitness goals. Out of that though, I realized that in the gym, um, it's very difficult uh, to find places for your phone. And so that's how this kind of came about. And it's been a long process. I've, we've really struggled with materials to try to find it right. We want it to be a bit more of a quality product, not just something that's, you know, six, seven bucks, and then you have to replace it in a few months. And so um, we set off on this journey to try to solve that problem. And we found out um, through a lot of trial and beta testers that this product actually is uh, meeting a lot of other needs that we didn't even think about. So truck drivers who like UPS and FedEx guys really like it. They stick it on their, on their trucks. We have women who really enjoy to stick it on their purses, especially when they're um, dressing up. Apparently there's an issue there and, or your phone at the bottom of a purse is an issue. And so being able to clip it um, a lot of, uh, women really liked that feature. And so 
we've continued on this process to try to get it out there to the masses and B9 has come along and just uh, really helped solve a, a problem we had for quite some time. So that's kind of where we are in the journey of things. And again, um, we have yet to find out what exactly the product's gonna really be. And, you know, I'm curious to just talk to me maybe a little bit about your product itself, like how it evolved. Did you try to seek other ways out of manufacturing it? What, you know, what was that evolution in the design and production uh, before? And then, you know, what made you come to us? Yeah, so I have a, I probably have a, a two dozen iterations of the product. And um, it's gone from so many different materials from just um, trying to you know, homegrown this with things you could buy at Lowe's to 3D printing. I have a 3D printer back here. We were trying that thing out. And so the evolution has been, we went through, like I said, two dozen different models and, and things weren't working right or it created other issues. And so through this whole process, we started trying to find, I, I tried to find people who were easy to work with. For, for me, the way I like to do business is, um, I need people who are going to help me. If I'm a transaction, then it's probably not going to work because we're going into this and we're trying to help people, you know, solve a need and we want to be that type of business for our customers. And so we look for that. And so I found these guys um, in South Dakota um, there. They were at, they were called primary actually, and they were producing the bands, um, the, the, this portion that I had mentioned, this part we call the band. And so they were producing that, went through many different materials from carbon and all kinds of other companies. They, they really struggled with getting the price point where we needed to be. And they actually recommended B9 for the mushroom portion. They said, hey, these are, these are some good guys, you'll like them. And they knew how I like to do business. And so they sent me over to Luke. Actually, there was another gentleman first, but it was like his last day he was still really helpful um sent me over there talked to luke we had a couple exchanges and he he really listened to our needs and then once he plugged us in with cody that i mean they basically solved in i think a week what we had gone back and forth on not i i'm trying not to exaggerate it but it's it's got to be close to a year it, it's at minimum six months and so okay. Yeah. That's a long time when you think about how many product iterations you need to do and on what timeline, man, that can really start to slow you down because you're trying to be responsive to your own customers and what they're asking you for. Exactly. And and we, we kept hitting a point to where people were saying, hey, when's the next version going to come out? When's the next version? And we were like, it's, it's not quite right. You know, these mushrooms aren't working. And um, Cody is the was the first one to really kind of listen to our need that it has to snap um, in our product when it's holding a thousand dollar phone people really like the tactile and the audio click of the two pieces coming together and when he when he heard that you know the emails back and forth was like hey i think we got the click and um i was like i was really excited and i was at at work when the pieces came in and my wife was like I think you're going to be happy. And sure enough, they do. They make that snap, which seems silly, but for a product, yeah, makes a big difference. Oh, that that's so cool. I love how you talked a little bit about, you know, I need someone that's going to help me win, right? That's going to listen to me and some of the material requirements. Were there any other things you were looking for um, when searching for someone to do some of this service bureau work with an eye towards a, a long-term partnership? What I originally wanted is somebody who could... Um, really also help us on the price point because again it's, it's it's one thing right to produce great if you guys can produce these for me but they're too expensive for me to get a product to market then then none of us are going to get paid <laughs> and so and so being able to have again lou kind of think long term and go okay what kind of price point are you trying to be at you know and where do we need to get this um down as, as far as costs go so that you can make a profit. That that was pretty cool and we were looking for that. I didn't even bring that up. Luke um, started going in that direction and, and I appreciated that because it was like one last thing I kind of had to address. Very cool. And the other neat thing I love maybe you could speak a little bit too is 
you're both prototyping right now with your rapid design iterations, but this is also your end use piece, right? So you're going to try to take this from design to prototype and then you'll be selling basically your product as a 3D printed part. Is that correct throughout its kind of its whole life cycle? For a portion of it, yes. Mm -hmm. So for the what we're calling the mushroom piece, um, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Th that cannot be injection molded. I, I found that out by contacting quite a few people. And so what we decided to do is just keep this piece 3D printed. It, it should give us a unique um, kind of um, uh, space in the market. And then what we hope to do is, is injection mold this piece, the band piece, because again, if it comes in contact with skin or whatever the case may be, it gives us much more, a lot more options and should be much more cost effective. But in the short term, um, we are going to take these prototypes and, and they will be very close to what would be um, mass produced. Yeah, that's very cool. You know, it's helpful, I think, even to talk with other companies about this, because what you're doing is still not immediately obvious to folks. It's like, OK, I can prototype here, but then how do I do some type of bridge production? Can I 3D print it until the cost of tooling makes sense? What does that look like? So I love this hybrid manufacturing approach you're doing where some of it's additive, some of it will be injection molded, but you're able to keep your price point and margins where you need to and scale up with by parts on demand before you ever, you know, cut any type of steel or aluminum and then have to go, oops, I need to change my part. <laughs> exactly. And I think I, I don't know for sure, but I feel like there aren't too many products that play in both spaces. Mm -hmm. even, even when I was looking for people to 3D print uh, the mushroom portion, it was very, hey, this, this is what you do for prototyping, but then you got to move over to manufacturing for the quantities. And, and I get that, mm -hmm. but, you know, it may bite us in the end, but, um, you know, if we can't meet demand with the quantity, but those are those are things I think we can solve if we have the capital behind us at that point. Cool. Well, those are all the questions I had. Is there anything I didn't ask that you think would be valuable to add either for internal folks or anything about the company or No, I would just, you know, again say I th I think what you guys are doing is is pretty unique. Um I mean, I almost uh mm -hmm. you know, I think about it in terms of um uh, like Chick-fil-A, right? Ch when you go to Chick-fil-A, there's a different level of service that you get when you go to some of the other fast food places. No. Um, and, and I think what you guys are doing and the approach you guys are trying to take, I, I think is going to yield very well in the future because just not many businesses, period, uh, take the time to really listen to a customer. And so, again, coming out of a market researching realm for Gosh, I was there for like 13 years and we worked with pretty big companies, Intel, IBM, we worked with Burger King, Sonic, all these companies. We were constantly telling them like, you need to listen to your customer, you know, and, and it, you'd be shocked how many don't. And so I think what you guys are doing is really well. So we talked a lot about this idea of service bureau versus in-house. And I think Martin brings up a point we haven't covered that might be helpful to understand. You know, Adrian, as you were dealing with providers and trying to find a, a technology partner, how important was customer experience or how easy that person was to work with? You know, how are responsive are they to me? What role did that play in your decision? Yeah, so Actuonics, we're a very small company. Um, we have about 10 full-time employees or so. So as a company, we put out our customer service experience is paramount and we like to see that as well with the companies that we work with. Um, so it was, it was very important to have a good customer service experience. I was dealing while well, I was talking with about four or five different 3d printing companies. Um, and it turned out that the printer that we liked the most was B nine C, but it also happened that they offered the best customer experience as well. Mm -hmm. And that was to me, that was huge because I'm going to be, I'm the one mainly working on these things. And as my first 3D printer in-house, um, having that experience and being able to talk with our, our uh, supplier about any issues that we may have and being able to have almost, you know, first name basis with them and them to be very familiar with our company and what our needs are um, was very important. Yeah. That's great. And you know, on a more technical note, maybe you both can feel this, you Eric and you Adrian. Another question we get a lot 
is actually on materials. So how do I need to think about materials as I go from either outsourcing to using additive in-house then to final production so that I know whatever I start with is representative of what I need to end with. Do either of you have any thoughts or advice on how to think about materials as you go throughout that value stream? Uh, yeah, so obviously material properties is extremely important in any engineering. Um, so having that data, uh, material property data sheets is a must. Um, and B9 is able to support support that information. But again, when you're selecting your material, you need to make sure that your 3D printed material is going to be representative of your manufactured material if you're not 3D printing manufacturing. Um, so that being said, you're going to need to compare some data off of the material sheets um, to really be able to determine if it's going to be in the ballpark of what you need. Um, there is some differences between the obviously 3D printed strength materials and engineering injection mold materials. Um, but being able to at least view the material data sheets has been extremely helpful. And then again, having the printer in house, I can now do my own force pull tests on many different parts and different iterations of those parts to determine what would be a pass and what would be a fail and what kind of features that I need to maintain throughout those parts. Yeah, I would kind of echo what Adrian just said, actually, but maybe go into a little more depth, you know, when you, uh, like he said earlier uh, in the meeting here, um, you kind of always have as the designer, you have the end material or the end process kind of in your mind from the beginning, right? So what you what you would want to look for when you're kind of prototyping your part, especially if you're going to do additive manufacturing, because the materials aren't exactly identical, what you want to do is probably pick out your top three, four uh, properties the, that are most important to you. Like if your part's going to be loaded heavily in tension, like pulling, uh, or in flexion, like bending, uh, you know, pick a material, um, an additive material that has uh, a similar value to whatever your end use. Uh, material is going to be and then if it doesn't you know have the same chemical compatibility it doesn't really matter that you're not really looking at that part right now right um so we're able to kind of meet those needs um i think in most cases i think we've been able to um probably kind of fit a person up with uh, you know when we're talking about prototyping specifically fit a person up with an additive material that will appropriately simulate um the end use product as long as you keep a few things in mind yeah that's great and i'd love to if, if maybe you could give everyone just an overview of our technology solutions eric yeah for sure so um here on the screen here you can see kind of a, a, a wide swath of the things we offer but um we offer hardwares we offer softwares um, services in some cases um, and materials uh, i'll start off by going through a little bit of the the hardware offering. Um, we have the B9 Core 5 Series um, XL printers um, that is available as a 405 nanometer um, printer. Um, the build area on that guy uh, looks like this. It's approximately uh, 70 millimeters by 125 millimeters um, and it's 127 in the Z here. So this side winds up being almost square. So that's about the size of part that you could actually fit in the printer. Um, given the larger size, this is a larger size than our um, core 550s or core 530s. Given the larger size uh, and the DLP technology, you would normally think that, you know, we we're going to suffer a little bit in terms of um, the accuracy of parts, but actually utilizing our uh, FAST technology, which is um, essentially just a software enabled uh, resolution enhancement. <laughs> uh, we're actually able to keep a lot of those uh, accuracies and precisions from the smaller machines in the larger build platform. Um, so yeah, that's the new uh, XL printer. We also have, in terms of the software to go along with it, we have a, um, uh, a slicing software called uh, Create. Um, 
it is actually the vehicle by which our fast technology is delivered to customers. So that create software is available um, on the older printers, the core 550s and 530s, as well as uh, it actually comes packaged with the new XL. But the cool thing about that is you can actually take your printer if you've already purchased one from us uh, and do, do an upgrade path and get some of those resolution gains on your older printer. We can make it print better than new uh, with just the software update. Um, another software I'll talk about that's compatible with all core series printers is uh, our V9 Captivate. Um, what this is, is a material settings development package. Uh, so if you want to run third party materials on your printer, or if you uh, even, you know, like our materials, but you really just need them to do one thing really, really well, or optimize, uh, you know, for speed in terms of I have a full build table full of parts, I'm not going to print anything but this full build table full of parts, and I just need it to print as quickly as it can without suffering quality. Um, you know, we from the factory kind of have to keep in mind a broad swath of, uh, of user applications or whatnot when we're making these settings. So they can oftentimes be tweaked for savings in terms of uh, pr print time or even uh, better quality in some instances um, if we know exactly what you're going to be printing. So this software actually enables that. And like I said, third party materials. Uh, we are open to third-party materials so um, with this software you're actually given three different tiers of ability you can have the uh, basic tier which is actually included free in our slicing software and there's actually two paid tiers there's a pro tier and an enterprise tier um, and each consecutive tier kind of just gives you more options in terms of um, dials you can turn uh, to get that ring that precision out of your uh, specific application uh, and like I said, that is compatible with all V9 core series printers. Um, in terms of materials, we do have our, uh, our rugged uh, nylon six material. Um, we try to name these materials in such a way that they, um, you know, communicate to an engineer like Adrian or me, what we're trying to <laughs> duplicate properties of, right? So uh, rugged specifically was intended to duplicate some of the properties of a nylon six type material. Um, we also have, you know, some more generic draft materials like black and gray. Um, we do have our new resilient silicone uh, material coming out that is an elastomeric type material, um, as well as kind of a whole uh, swath of new engineering materials that I am not entirely sure that I can talk about on this call yet. <laughs> but we've got some really, uh, we've got some really exciting stuff coming up uh, in terms of that as well. And then we did talk about um, Service Bureau a little bit on the last page, but in terms of, uh, you know, services we offer, that is a big one, uh, whether you need to just figure out, um, you know, I can't justify the printer costs, the upfront cost of a printer yet. I need to, um, I need to, you know, get dip my toe in this and figure it out. We can actually help you grow and nurture your business, um, you know, through our service bureau offering um, all the way to, you know, if you have, uh, this is another instance that's just happened recently. If you have the ability to do additive manufacturing in house, but suddenly you get a job that comes in that is just kind of just a little bit outside of the capacity you have. Um, you can use us to stretch your capacity, even if it's only temporarily um, and, and grow your business in that sense as well. Um, I think that's about it. Was there anything else that you wanted me to talk about there, Danny? I think that was a great overview. Maybe if you could just, you know, briefly touch on the post processing end of the spectrum, the kind of the cleaning and curing. Yes. Um, yes, we do have post processing devices as well. Um, so our, uh, our products kind of cover the entire uh, workflow from the front end with the cam and the slicing, even to the material settings type, if you want to go down that trail, all the way through the printing process, all the way to the end where you get the end use product. So we do have, it's actually depicted on the screen right now, we do have the V9 clean unit, which is that taller device right there. Um, it, uh, it does accept uh, both the uh, old, older core series, the 550 and the 530 uh, build volume, as well as the new uh, XL build volume, uh, excuse me, build volume, while uh, still maintaining 
the lowest isopropyl uh, usage per wash cycle um, in the industry, as far as I know. And um, the cure unit that, that comes after it um, is also adaptable for both the 550, 530, and the XL platforms. Um, it does have uh, different things built in, like different wavelengths. I think it'll cure, it'll cure at uh, 385, it'll cure at 405. So you can actually use that um, uh, even if you have additive in-house right now, you can actually consolidate some of your post-processing equipment with, with these two pieces of, uh, of devices as well. Excellent. So you touched on a lot of great part of the Service Bureau. The only thing I want to call out here is sometimes people want to start with how can I manufacture this part? And we really try to start with what should this part do? You know, to Eric's and Adrian's point, thinking about the, the end in mind, and that's why we have this consultation, kind of a design review before it goes anywhere in terms of quoting or, or delivering the part. You know, I'd love, Adrian, you shared a story once where uh, you were using these materials and you decided to adopt the printer, but then you wanted to test the materials a little bit more after that to make sure you had made the right choice. Could you, could you kind of talk about that in terms of it's this consultative, ongoing design collaboration <laughs> between the supplier and, and yourself? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, as we were getting familiar with printers and things, we really needed to see what kind of part quality and how our parts turned out in terms of our small, intricate features. Um, so we were able to uh, actually, B9 was one of the only companies who offered to take our parts and print them for us at no additional cost to give us some test prints. Um, so that was a huge help. Um, I did get some sample prints from other companies, not of our parts, but of their own samples that they make, which is, which is okay, but it doesn't necessarily show you exactly how they're going to produce your parts or parts like your parts. Because I mean, any 3D printer company could, you know, dial in a few, three or four different parts to look amazing, but how are they going to produce your parts? And that's the biggest thing is you can see all these nice parts produced on many different 3D printers but you want to know that that printer can produce your parts to the specs that you need. Um, so that's where B9 came in and it, they really shot far above the rest in terms of they were able to supply me multiple different materials of the same part for me to try out because I wasn't familiar with any of their materials. Um, and this was one way of quickly and they offered it, which was phenomenal. And they ended up sending me three different material choices of my parts and I was super happy with the quality and I was able to see, okay, which materials may I want to start with when we order this printer. That's wonderful. And as we wrap up here, I'm going to let Eric give just a quick sneak peek. He talked about our silicone, but we have another pretty exciting resin um, that will be coming out this month. Do you want to just tell folks a little bit about our new BioRes Micro Precision resin? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we we do have, like I mentioned, the the silicone or elastomeric uh, material. Um, that one is pretty neat to play with in terms of the response that it that it gives. And by response, I mean how quickly it returns back to its original shape. Um, and then you know it's a typical elastomeric type of material. It's got um, a high tear strength. Um, that that thing that that taller column thing you can see pictured there is actually a, a grip for a bicycle handlebar. So if you can kind of envision that in your head, that's about what you're looking at there. Um, the BioRes micro precision part, uh, we actually heard from uh, Kevin, I think earlier on this uh, particular application, but um, it is specifically formulated to do very small, very high detail pieces very, very well. Um, in addition uh, to being biocompatible. So um, by small, I mean, uh, we had, we kind of had an image on this sooner where it was held between tweezers, but I don't even know if you can see this. I have to keep it in a baggie so I don't accidentally blow it off the desk by walking by or something. Um, this, this thing will print really, really small stuff. I mean, you're talking, you know, features down to a thou on that fin right there. So that's specifically what the BioRes micro precision uh, material is for. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
How does the BioRes Micro Precision compare to the HD Slate? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take that, Danny? Or should sure. I? So what we try to do is folks loved the precision of that material so much. We wanted to replicate the output that you could get with that, but in a way that fit in a medical regulatory environment. So we engineered a resin that would deliver these incredibly fine micro scale features and put it through ISO biocompatibility testing so that we are able to deliver something that could be, you know, external skin contact up to 30 days viable. And so that's what it's the testing it's undergoing right now. Cool. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So stay, stay tuned. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be out soon. Um, and if anyone here wants any more information about the products or to request a sample standard or to Adrian's point, I want to see what my parts look like on your technology or even look at a product demo or, or talk to Eric or another solutions expert directly, hop on over and visit our virtual booth. And of course you can reach out at any time at our email, phone number and contact info below. And I also want to thank our panelists for sharing all that great information today. You're welcome. No problem.